uh, very much, Katrina. Uh, great to see you all. And uh, for those medical students who either never get off the AM dial or uh, haven't got a clue where Radio National is, um, <laughs> you can always podcast it. And, um, and uh, so, but th thank you very much. And congratulations to, the, I was here for um, most of the last hour, <coughs> to the, the speakers, some great presentations. And I, um, and all about translation, it's all about research into clinical practice. And I'm going to talk a little bit upstream, and I know that there are some, <coughs> pardon me, web lab researchers in the room, um, some curiosity room researchers. And um, you might feel a little bit beaten up by the end of the hour. Um, but it's a serious issue which we need to confront. What is the issue? Well, the issue is that we do quite well in terms of our research publication rate. So, and by the way, I, I don't show PowerPoint. It's partly because it's coming from radio, but it's also a way of being seen, that being seen but not heard. Um, so there won't be any PowerPoints. Two, two and a half to three percent of the world's publications come out of Australia. Um, we, and they tend to be of higher impact, um, in higher impact journal. Before that, there was the Wills Report, which was called the Virtuous Cycle. And this was the idea that, in fact, you do research and there's a cycle into discovery and into practice in the clinic. Uh, you learn from that and you move back, you generate new hypotheses, and you get this virtuous cycle of research into practice. But it's often more of a hope than a reality. And what is going wrong? We're not alone, by the way. Um, um, the junk bond, bond king, Michael Milken, who spent many years, in, several years in jail because of his um, nefarious financial activities um, and has been trying to redeem himself ever since. And others use the phrase the value of death. And that won't be a new phrase to the fundamental researchers in this room. The value of death is kind of the notion that you've got a huge investment. We have got a huge investment. Many billions of dollars in Australia actually add up all the research that takes place in the health sector in Australia. Um, but if you actually, that, so all that research is on one side of the valley, generating discovery, and then only a little bit dribbles to the other side, which is that innovation index that I was talking about. And in between are products, potentially useful molecules, useful ideas, useful um, diagnostics, which actually never see the light of day. And why does that happen? What is the problem there in Australia? And I, the NHMRC is concerned about this. <coughs> They've now created, created a translation faculty, which has 2,800 members, has 14 steering groups, uh, the NHMRC has put out a call for people to buy for the title of advanced um, research and translation centers, and people are calling all of themselves to become such. Within an environment where we are 116 on the list, so you have to assume that not very many of the people who are applying actually do very much useful translation. So there might be advanced health research centers, but I'm not aware of any advanced translational research centers in Australia. So this is an aspiration. So we're going to get that ticket to people who do not do very much, even the best. And it's sometimes hard to know who the best are. So what is going on? And um, I'm conscious of the fact that there are many medical students in the room. The research enterprise, I mean, it's fantastic. You've got several days here of presentation of research um, around this precinct. And research is a great enterprise, and I hope that many of you take up research. People who take up research are good people. <clears throat> They're clever people. They could be doing lots of other things with their lives, but they choose to have low incomes, uncertain incomes, um, and careers that bounce around through no fault of their own, but through the vagaries of research funding. The problem is, I think, and I don't think the NHMRC is confronting this strongly enough, is that the structure of research in the way we fund it and the way we reward it in, mitigates against useful discovery into the clinic. So what you have in Australia 
is a whole, <clears throat> because it's difficult to do, people, researchers end up, if you're a successful researcher, you end up thinking, I can't be bothered anymore with university bureaucracy or hospital bureaucracy. I'm going to set up my own institute. So I've got some independence to do what I want to do. They're not bad people. They are empire builders. Uh, they do build silos. By the way, silos aren't necessarily bad things. Talk to any farmer, you know, that protects the crop and keeps the rats out. <clears throat> but, so you get these institutes created. They're often created by men, not women. They're often created because you happen to know a couple of what they say in the finance world, high net worth individuals who give you some money. And then you gather more high net worth individuals a fundraising committee, and you jealously guard your income source. In Canberra, you've been, Canberra there are many high net worth individuals, there's a lot of medium net worth individuals, um, more than most other parts of the country, but not many high net worth individuals. But you've been lucky in Canberra where you've had government investment. So the John Curtin School of Medical Research you know, has had, over many years, substantial government investment to get it going because it lacked, uh, in many ways, the uh, high network donations you're able to get from places like the Walter and Lyle Hall Institute. So we do well, we've got lots of good researchers, we've got a few Nobel laureates, possibly I have a look recently, but possibly more than we merit by our population level. So you get these empires. Now empires are built on reputation. They're built on gaining credit for your institute for discoveries made so that the high net worth individuals keep on donating money to your institute for the work of that institute. Now we're not talking about people here who are involved in criminal activities. They're trying to do good stuff. They're trying to of the structure that mitigates. But what happens then is that people tend to work in an isolated fashion. And in Australia, you have the paradox in some places, where people collaborate more with people overseas than people around the corner. So they've got good, inter well, almost all frontline researchers have very good international networks of people that are collaborating with. But they're often collaborating with people just like them. So it's, you know, they're, they're examining one molecular pathway and they know, who, they know everybody in that molecular pathway. But it's also highly competitive. There are no prizes in biomedical science for being second. You've got to be first. And so there's game playing that goes on. Because you don't, your collaborators are also seen as your competitors. So you've got to be first with your results. <clears throat> so the sort of game playing that goes on is they don't want, because they know if they're doing something really esoteric, they, there are only a limited number of reviewers for the grants. And they don't want the reviewers to know too much about what they're doing, because they, even though reviewers are supposed, not supposed to do anything with that information, it's very hard to avoid leakage. So the, what you get is game playing, where people apply for grants for research they've already done. And they use that money for research to advance it e you know, even further. You could say, is this dishonest? Is it fraud? What have you? That's a moot point. It's not. It's, it's just, <clears throat> in my, it, 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 but it is game playing. And so you want to be first, you want to get the recognition, and you get rewarded for that by the system. You don't get rewarded necessarily. NHMRC is struggling with this. You don't necessarily get rewarded for practical discovery, and I'll give you an example of the perverse incentives in a moment. You get rewarded for you being first with the paper in the high impact journal that turns out to be well cited. Now, when we're dealing with things like cancer, or various cancers, we're talking about wicked problems which are really difficult to solve. And we want really good people who know a lot about a little. But the, and the market, if you like, <coughs> fails. You won't find venture capitalists or um, the private sector wanting to invest 
in people at the John Curtin School of Medical Research who delve into uh, molecular bio, you know, biomedical, uh, who are doing highly detailed fundamental biomedical research. They're not the slightest bit interested in that because the discovery rate, even to get to the, the one side of the valley of death, is quite low. They're not even interested, by the way, in taking a promising molecule to the next stage. Because one reason for the valley of death, and I'm dashing around a little bit here, but one reason, even if you get to the point where you've got something useful, and I would argue that the structure of biomedical research, both here and overseas, mitigates against discovery of even the promising molecule at the beginning of the valley of death, the height there, then you've got all sorts of other problems because you've got a pipeline of innovation that needs to occur for things to be slotted in. So you might have a useful molecule, and it looks really promising in, in, mouse, in mouse models. For venture capitalists to be interested in taking this to the next stage, they want it what's called de-risked. They want it to be a little bit way up the valley on the other side before they will come in with their capital to take it further. So for example, uh, you might have a molecular target, you've designed a molecule, it's useful in mice, and you want to go to the next stage, which would be further preclinical testing and then maybe a phase one trial. For it to get to a phase one trial, you've got to send it off, for example, to a medicinal chemist, and there aren't many good groups in that in Australia, who then take your molecule and make it into a better molecule that's worth trialing, and maybe even then take it to a phase one trial. So you do more advanced animal work, and then you get it to the point where you've got a really refined molecule that could then go to a phase one trial, which is a safety trial in humans. At that point, venture capitalists start to become interested and pharmaceutical companies start to become interested. <clears throat> so the market, if you like, fails right through to the uphill of the valley of death. Now, the 2,800 members of the translation faculty at NH and MRC and the 14 steering groups are all faffing around in different parts of it. They may be doing important stuff, but the key thing is to get those molecules at one side of the valley and to actually have the translational pipeline well in place so that you slot into that process with your intellectual property guarded. I want to spend a bit of time talking about, if you like, in my sense, the left-hand side of the valley and the generation of, of useful products which might be taken further. Because I actually don't think that we are doing well enough in getting to that point. The United States is something like a consortium of 60 clinical translation research centers. Uh, they have a national approach to it. The UK is interested in this. Well, we are not alone uh, in this area. But for many of these prod problems that we're trying to crack, it's not, the, the expertise is not in one group. So when I come back to market failure, the, this, uh, let, let me just state what my argument is. My argument is that you need to actually get significant discovery to get to one side of the hill. You need people at the table that you've never even imagined should be there. And the one person who's missing consistently is the consumer. Because the part, you could say, well, researchers have got to a, a lot to lose if their research project doesn't succeed um, because it's their career. But the people who've really got skin in the game are consumers, are people with the problem. And you've got to bring the right people to the table to start answering the problem, and they usually do not exist in one institution. So I'll give you a few examples of how this is happening overseas and a little bit here and how it's just one part of the problem. But let me finish with market failure. Because government, because industry, I mean, this government we've got now likes to think, and I think the Labour government beforehand liked to think, that uh, the market will solve everything. It will solve some stuff. Market's really good at getting products to market, you know, developing products and then getting them to market. Markets are terrible at providing health care to populations and markets are terrible at providing education, and they're terrible at providing fundamental research. So the role of the NH and MRC and the ARC is to develop really good researchers who 
increasingly know a hell of a lot about a little. And, but, the, but the role I th I'm arguing today is of philanthropy. Philanthropy needs to consolidate and organize and become much more assertive and aggressive so that once tax Australian taxpayers have trained these fantastic researchers, philanthropy should be pulling them out of the foxhole and looking widely to see how they could solve important problems. The tradition in philanthropy around the world and in Australia is we will gather money together. My loved one died of breast cancer uh, or pancreatic cancer or multiple sclerosis and I will create a foundation in their memory and we will fund good research to find a cure for this dreadful disease. But they're deluded. They're absolutely deluded if they follow the traditional pathway. And the traditional pathway is I get a few hundred thousand dollars or a few million dollars together, really well thought, you know, people who care about this put the money together. But what they then do is they call for projects. So they want researchers to apply to them with their best ideas for research. You think, well, that's fantastic. That's a good thing to do. We've got clever people generate ideas. But what you then find is that immunologists apply for diabetes research because they think, oh, well, I could tweak my research to make that look like a diabetes project. And everybody starts off their research line with, if, this, if my research succeeds, it will result in better therapies for cancer, blah, blah, blah. And then they get a, a few of the uh, uh, researchers to sit on panels to review those and the best research, the rest research gets funded. So it's not that lousy research gets funded, highly competitive, and good research gets funded from this philanthropic money. But it doesn't get cures. It very rarely gets better treatments. Very rarely gets things into practice. So what's emerging is much more assertive philanthropy around the world. And it's beginning to hit in Australia. So let me give you some examples. A group in London, at University College London, um, at the Institute of Ophthalmology, was, and they, were, they had some promising work on um, age-related macular degeneration. And an, an anonymous donor from the United States gave them some money. And the money was conditional on them working towards an effective treatment for uh, wet form macular degeneration uh, within five years and put, I think, five million US dollars on the table. Or was it five million pounds? I can't remember now. And Pete Coffey at the uh, Institute of Ophthalmology and an ophthalmologist there took up the challenge. It was called the London, London Project Against Blindness, I think it was called. And, but the donor insisted on project management, milestones, and the implicit threat was there that if you weren't reaching your milestones, we were going to pull the plug on your money and give it to somebody else. So they organized themselves. They looked around for who they needed, and they weren't necessarily in, at University College London. They also knew they needed industry involved, and eventually gathered about $20 million of money leveraged. And on five years almost to the day after that money was donated and the project started, they had a product going through regulatory approval and it's now going through clinical trials, stem cell treatment. Might work, might not work, but it's a hell of a lot faster than others have found. I came across another one just by accident. Um, I had an eye problem when I was, in, uh, uh, I was in Seattle and I had an eye problem. I had to see a retinal surgeon on a Sunday morning and very kind, this guy very kindly saw me and uh, didn't charge me with great relief because I wasn't insured. <laughs> anyway, uh, almost in gratitude, I started engaging him in conversation about what research he was doing at the University of Washington, Seattle. And he said, ah, oh, I do this and that. But my, the really interesting thing I'm doing now is in a topic that I've got absolutely no interest in. Um, so he told me this story that he had a patient, a young woman with a dreadful condition called Usher's 3 where um, I did pediatrics and you're supposed to know these small print problems. But Usher's three is you become deaf and blind in adolescence. It's a ter terrible condition. Her father was immensely wealthy. He was one of the first people into hedge funds of hedge funds, whatever that means. It sounds as if I know what I'm talking about. And 
he had been giving money to uh, a major foundation in the United States uh, that researches blindness, but had been doing it in the traditional way, uh, where calling, you know, giving large sums of money and calling for grants, calling for people to put in their best ideas. It got nowhere. So the guy, the, this father, in frustration, said to this ophthalmologist, he said, look, I will build you and your own institute devoted to this condition. This guy, and the ophthalmologist said, look, I'm not interested in an institute. I don't want to do this. I'm not, you know, with all due respect, I don't, this is not my research area. Um, um, but he said, give me a couple of mu a million bucks and let me see what I can do. So they created a foundation. And what he did, because he knew who was who, he farmed that money out on project-driven research. Within a, within a year, they had a candidate target. They knew what the defect was in the gene. So for, after years of giving money in an undirected way, by farming the research out with key groups who knew what they were on about, who weren't necessarily researching this area, they got further, than in, they got further in one year than other people had got in many years. The Cystic Fibrosis, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in the United States were getting very, very frustrated, got large money, large amounts of money, promising their donors that they were looking for the cure or effective treatments for cystic fibrosis, and no new molecules for about 15, 20 years. I think DNAs was the last useful molecule. So they said, we're, we're changing the way, and this is the consumer piece. So we're changing the way we're doing business. We're not going to take this anymore. We've almost been pathetically grateful to researchers in the past. That's over. We are actually going to give our money to discovery. We want new treatments. And we're going to manage them, and we're not going to take shit from anyone. So they started a very aggressive approach, which also had a business model attached to it. They created a company, uh, which a not-for-profit company, which actually shared in the IP, and they directed research and project managed research and still do to this day in terms of getting new treatments for cystic fibrosis. And from there having been no new molecules in development, there are now five going through clinical, uh, going, that have just got beyond preclinical testing. Not only are there five new molecules emerging from this work, some of which won't work, one of which works for I think about 5% of people, because it's such a long gene with so many defects in it, you, you're probably going to get small parts of the population, but they now actually effectively have a cure for a very small group of, C, of people with CF. And they're also testing other products which weren't in clinical trial at all. <coughs> so, you know, they still invest a little bit in fundamental research, but a lot in drug research. Myeloma Foundation doing the same sort of thing. And the Lowy family, people who, who own Westfield Corporation, they have in, running in their family um, a rare um, degenerative condition of the macula called macular telangiectasia, and they're doing the same thing. So they, they, have, they fund research, and they manage the research. They have found out who is who in this, and who needs to be brought in, and they are managing it forward. I don't think they've got a cure yet, but I think things are moving reasonably quickly. So it's not passive research. So I tried this out. So I've been, I've been going on about this for a while. And um, so I'll tell you a little story. I have a personal interest in pancreatic cancer. Some members of my family have had it. And people I'm close to, <coughs> Ian Carroll, the husband of, the husband of Geraldine Duke, had pancreatic cancer, some of my closest friends. And did, wanted to do something about it. And I got involved with a, a, research, a, a foundation, a charitable foundation, called Avnerds after a senior executive at Woolworths who died of pancreatic cancer. And Woolworths and Coca-Cola Amatil have got behind this foundation, and they've generated quite a lot of income. And they started off by funding projects, you know, individual studies, and they fell over. And they started losing confidence in their investment strategy for the money that they had. And I was having a chat with them as, because I was their ambassador. I said, well, why don't we take a punt on this assertive, stroke, aggressive approach to pancreatic cancer research funding? So what we did was, and, this, and because individual, so we've got individually, we've got some very good pancreatic cancer researchers. 
They tend to be in Queensland, Sydney, and Western Australia to some extent. And um, Melbourne's a bit light on, actually, with pancreatic cancer research, which is a bit unusual. This is so strong in other things. But anyway, we brought, so we, to, we gathered, what this foundation did was funded people to come together for a weekend to talk about a national pancreatic cancer research strategy. What I did then, what I, but what I did in the background was I surveyed pancreatic cancer researchers and other cancer researchers around the world to say, what are the opportunities here if you were to invest in that? Where would you put your money? To compare that to what locals thought. And then I brought, pe and I brought people into the room who'd never done any pancreatic cancer research at all, but who were very good biologists and cancer researchers. So the pancreatic cancer researchers couldn't just talk to each other in their own language. They had people, some of whom were much better than they were, in their you know, better, stronger track records in cancer research, just not in their field. But that wasn't enough in my view, because I'd looked at what other people had done. And other, what other people had done was, they tried to shake up the thinking and get people to think in a different way. Very hard to do when you've been down in your foxhole for 20 years of your career. So I brought business people in the room, people who are really successful in business, really good minds, and I brought one group in the room who are a big data company called Quantium. They're actually half owned by Woolworths, and they know more about you and I than we know about ourselves. You know, they know what magazine you read if you buy a mango in Woolies, you know, <coughs> things like that. In fact, interestingly, these big data companies who are in retail, not in health, I think have the secrets for some, you know, we were talking about your lifestyle uh, cofactors. Well, what are these people buying? Well, you can imagine what they're buying, but do you really know? Do you know which Woolworths or Coles they're buying it in? How, how would you actually change their behavior? Because we, don't, we, we just faff around at the edges in terms of health promotion and health interventions. Big data people have actually got the targeted information to make it happen, but that's, that's by the by. But it is about translation of really good work in epidemiology into product. We don't have the right people at the table. But coming back to this room, so two of the founders of Quantium came for this whole weekend, incredibly, given the, the sort of $3 billion business or something, and give us a weekend of their time, it was fantastic. So to give you an idea of what happens when you have that sort of conversation, a really eminent researcher, really eminent researcher from Melbourne who studies apoptosis, programmed cell death. So most people, a lot, sorry, one of the reasons you can get cancer is that cells don't die as they should, and they become immortal. So he was standing up, and I can't remember what the context was, but he was standing up and saying, look, one of the problems is even when you've got genetically identical mice, you don't get the same effect from the experiment. You, you get random effects, and it's really annoying. And uh, the Greg Schneider from Quantium stood up and said, you know, Professor, I didn't understand a single word you said until you used the word random. And everybody's head looked up. He said, nobody in my company is allowed to use the word random. <laughs> so this is like, you know, this is, his core business is stats and maths, and nobody's allowed, because there's no such thing as random. Or if there is such a thing as random, it's an incredibly rare event. You're just using that to hide your ignorance. Because <laughs> you don't really, something's happening with those mice, but you, you're blaming it on a random effect when it actually might be something serious. So, and this researcher, he's a lovely guy, the researcher, he went white, not because of it, not from anger, but because the light bulb goes on. So what did we, it took me a weekend. This is how entrenched the barriers are to collaboration. Everybody talks about collaboration. And, uh, being a good thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. There are lots of costs attached uh, to collaboration. There's time, there's money, effort, and so on. So collaboration's got to be worth it. And of course, there are no prizes for collaboration if you're being distracted from an experiment you're doing that you know you're going to actually get a result from, and you'll get a publication, and you'll get abstracts, and you'll get your next two or three years of your postdoc um, or a chair. So there's lots of disadvantages to collaboration. It took me a whole weekend to get people close to it. And also close to the counterintuitive stuff, because we think that research is the only thing that's going to actually get us there. 
And uh, w one of the people in the steering group for this is John Salzberg from the, uh, that stage at the Peter McCallum in Melbourne. And he said, well, what's our objective here? Well, our objective here is to double survival in the next five years for people with pancreatic cancer, five to 10 percent. He said, okay, well, if you want to double survival, here's one way of getting your, your, a, a few extra you know, points on, on the percentage. Which, and he quoted a statistic, which I actually already knew, but I hadn't translated this, is that your survival varies by twofold with pancreatic cancer, depending on who your GP refers you to. Twofold. So, you know, Canberra, you've got very limited options, but, um, and I have no idea what the hepatobiliary surgeons are here like, um, but if you are referred to a well-organized hepatobiliary unit who do lots of pancreatic cancer surgery, who have well-organized teams, so about 60% of this is the hospital and the team, and about 40% the skill of the surgeon, then you're twice as likely to live longer than if you're sent to somebody who pretends to be a hepatobiliary surgeon, does the occasional operation, and doesn't have a team, more importantly probably, probably a very good surgeon, but doesn't have a team around them in the hospital. Twofold difference. In Sydney, um, because they collect the best information in Australia in this, in New South Wales, uh, with, with bowel cancer, particularly lower uh, bowel cancer, so rectal cancer, the difference in survival is even bigger. So he said, if you could just guarantee that everybody goes, you know, who's referred with pancreatic cancer goes to an e a, a center of excellence in pancreatic cancer, you're going to you know, raise your survival rates. I mean, obviously, it's a smaller group who are operable, but it's a smaller group. So one of the things that we had to drag people to is actually, could you actually set up a set of clinical standards by which you would judge pancreatic cancer units and that people would aspire to? Well, that was one of the outcomes of the weekend, but by God, it took a lot of time to get there. Then what was clear from the group was that um, you've got multiple groups with their own mouse models. You know, they do these hybrids where they graft on the tumor and they've got a certain genetic profile and they've all got their own little mouse models. And I know we've got the National Proteome Facility here in Canberra with lots of mouse models, but they tend to focus on their own. And what happens, talking about the valley of death, they get a promising molecule, they test it in their mouse model, it doesn't work, they think, oh. Or it's promising and then the grant runs out, they lose their postdocs, and then somebody 25 years from now will say, oh, Someday at JCMR had a really good idea 25 years ago. Whatever happened to it? Because the money ran out and the NHMRC didn't renew. Because you only got a 17% success rate. Or they only tested it in one model and it, worked, it might have worked in two more. So what they came up with in this group, again, took agony. And six months later, it's still not organized, despite a million dollars a year from this foundation being on the table, a million dollars a year is to do parallel processing, where they'd share their mouse models, promising molecule, they'll do it in parallel, link to the clinicians so that you're actually doing real live testing with people who are likely to be dead in two years. Um, so you actually don't need much benefit to see the result. You probably don't need many phase three randomized trials. And so you have this parallel preclinical testing going into clinical testing. That was what we came up with. Still not in place, despite a lot of money being on the table. That's how hard it is to do. So the NHMRC can go off with their translation faculty, their 2,800 members, their 14 steering groups. They've got to solve that problem before they even get to the problem of how you plug in venture capital and get people, how you de-risk what you're finding. Because if they find the molecule, it's promising, um, then you're still going to actually have to commercialize it in the end and do something with it. and have and move forward. And in many ways, we have the beginnings of that structure here, but it's getting people to collaborate on solving these difficult problems up front and bringing new minds to the table. But my argument is that unless consumers and philanthropists drive it, it's not going to happen. Because whilst I've been slamming into the NHMRC, the NHMRC's job, I think, is to build big and significant research, human and physical infrastructure, although we don't build physical infrastructure very much at all in Australia. So we have this research capacity in Australia, similar with ARC. We expect results from that, but we're kind of asking an organization which is built for one thing to do another. 
I think we should be using philanthropy to take that next step. But here's the problem. You've got empires in philanthropy too. And so you've got all these piddly little charities all over the place. Some of them aren't piddly, aren't piddly, but they're all doing their own little thing. And they're frightened to collaborate because then they would lose the ability, there's their identity, enable to, which enables them to raise money for their future activities. It's not that they're doing bad stuff, it's just that they could be doing so much better stuff. And people know this. So, for example, Cancer Council Australia has been working with the National Breast Cancer Foundation and others to try and consolidate some of these piddly little research charities, some of them are not so piddly, to try and cooperate so that you actually get synergy and moving forward. Because that's what we need. We're not going to get it, I think, from government organisations. We are going to have to move forward because it does need more of a commercial focus or an outcomes focus for people to do what consumers want. If you're a parent of a child with cystic fibrosis, you want that child to live a normal lifespan. And if you've got money and donate it, that's what you want to donate your money to. But at the moment, you don't. You think you do, but you don't. So donors have got to ask more of the charities, and charities have got to get together, consolidate their money, because we are not great philanthropists in Australia, into large lakes of money, and make ambitious and bold investments. Now you may ask, <clears throat> what happens to curiosity-driven research, serendipity, where great discoveries are made? Well, we have a multi-billion dollar research industry which is built on serendipity. My view is we've got more than enough serendipity, but tell me where the results are. There haven't been many studies of this. Two researchers called Comro and Drips did a fascinating study, I think it was in the late 60s, some of you may have read it, worth looking up, where they, from memory, they looked up, they, they actually said, look, we've got open heart surgery. What were, how much of the discoveries, how many of the, what proportion of the discoveries that led to open heart surgery were serendipitous, curiosity driven, and what proportion were directed at the actual job at hand? We want to actually be able to operate on hearts and do something about it. And it was a large proportion, there's no question, it was a large proportion was curiosity driven research. Not necessarily serendipitous, but it was curiosity. So, you know, Harvey discovery of the flow of blood, um, the discovery of electricity, I mean, it goes back to all that when you think about what you need in place um, to be able to do open heart surgery. But a very substantial proportion was not curiosity driven. It was directed at the aim. We want to be able to open up children's hearts, replace their valves, correct the defects, and the same for adults. We need both, but we've got more than enough serendipity. We need to get organized, we need to plan, and we need to try and achieve targets. And most of this research will fail. It fails already, and the hope is that less will fail. There's nothing wrong in failure. But at least it's failure trying to achieve something useful. So if you know a handy philanthropist, <laughs> perhaps convince them about assertive philanthropy moving forward in health research. Thank you very much. Of course. I've insulted enough people in the room. Yes. Well, it's, it's a funny index, actually, because there's some surprising countries down near the bottom that you think would be nearer the, nearer the top. But I, think, I don't think Singapore is that high, for example. We all talk about Singapore. Um, 
So I, th I think that um, we, have, we have an underdone venture capital uh, industry in Australia, which is very risk adverse. Um, so that you have, it's getting better, but they don't like, you know, it's very risk averse. So you, what you find in the United States is that they will pick up. So this de-risk, this de-risking, which we have to invest in in the valley here to get people up the other side, there's less de-risking that needs to happen in uh, the United States. There's probably um, less of a stigma and more role models for science and health entrepreneurs in the U.S. situation and in some other countries. It's so that it's not seen, you know, look down your nose as a, a bad career move. So, so kids going into science think that they could actually make money out of science. I think that's an important thing. So people are looking for things that they could make money out of. And I think that's what you need is that sort of hunger for, uh, for that sort of innovation. And we do have those people in Australia and they are creating new businesses. Of course, one of the problems here is that because they don't pick up Australian venture capital, they often end up picking up American venture capital. And then what happens is the, major, the American venture capital companies start screwing them down and it becomes much easier for them to operate out of the United States. So we lose biotech companies, we lose companies like ResMed to the United States because it becomes easier for them to go into capital markets in the United States with a US resident company because capital markets here are so risk averse. I think that's a major, that's a major issue. And then we've got to think hard about how we reward um, individual researchers. And the same debate goes on here. NIH isn't, or MRC, aren't that different to NIH and MRC in terms of how they reward researchers. But there is a bit more of a career path if you go into translation and reward. And, in, and to be fair to NHMRC, they are trying to look at this. But it is hard when global research works on a different paradigm. <coughs> yes? That, that's absolutely right. And even when you've got a good reputation, so on the health report on Monday, I had John Hopper talking about this um, um, pathway gene to BRCA2 um, in breast cancer called PALB2. And uh, the, the findings there that this is as significant a gene for breast cancer as BRCA1, BRCA2, the tenfold increased risk. But he's doing very complicated work using supercomputer, a supercomputer in Melbourne on multiple um, SNPs across the genome, hundreds if not thousands of SNPs across the genome, trying to actually further identify breast cancer subtypes. And he says it's just getting really hard for journals to even accept that because it's a different paradigm. They're used to single gene analyses. And, uh, so, and he's a well-published researcher in this area. So it's not just serendipity, it's just changing you know, science, and it's another, uh, is another issue. Science has its fads, and it's very hard to shake them from their fads. Um, uh, is this on? Uh, oh, uh, we uh, have toyed with the idea of crowdfunding for research in the ACT, because as you point out, we don't have a lot of high net worth individuals, so, but we have a lot of middle worth individuals. Have you, can you give us any insights uh, as to the success or even the there's a bit going on, um, but I can't give you the numbers, uh, numbers there. There's a fascinating story about crowdsourcing solutions. So Nicholas Gruen, who some of the name of you would know, Gruen's a well-known Canberra name, who's an economist, and uh, his father's Fred Gruen, uh, um, an economist at this university, I think was the founder of the economics faculty. But Nicholas, uh, with others, created a company called Kaggle. And Kaggle is a, it's now based in America. But um, and it crowdsourced solutions for mathematical modeling. So they created competitions. And, um, and so there were prizes for this. And they just put the problems out there. So some of them were biomedical and some of them weren't. So for example, they, um, 
They had one which was um, about traffic flow on the F5, F4 freeway in Sydney. How do you, what's the model there? And it was one by somebody in Toronto who came up with quite a good model. Then they put out one on early growth dynamics of HIV. And I think it was one by a games developer in Baltimore. Um, then the group, there was a group um, that, because you want to try and find, it's fine wanting to know the molecular structure and shape of um, three-dimensional shape of viruses, but it actually it's quite hard because it's constantly moving and you've got to find the least energetic state. Of, so they, they, I think it was HIV, they put out a competition using game, video game technology because you actually, had, so, and they gave the, the players um, the parameters about what would be the least energetic state, but it required multiple calculations. And I think it was won by a 14 year old who just played this game. And then there's this thing called Galaxy Zoo, which is worth looking up, where astronomers have done the equivalent of the Human Genome Project, but in the sky. And they've, so they've done a digital survey of the sky, got all these objects, and then they reckon it would take them 30 years to analyze it. So they put this out to the crowd. And I think all they had to do initially was classify a spiral from um, a spiral from a helical, something like that, a spiral from a helical galaxy. And within a week or two, they had two million um, uh, analytics a day. And they'd, they'd finished it within no time at all. Then they moved on to the next thing. And in fact, a teacher in, and these weren't astronomers are doing this, it's just the general public that liked the idea of the sky. And then a teacher in Holland called Henny came up with a new astronomical object from this thing, which nobody knew what it was. It was like a green object. So I think, I think the Dutch was uh, Vervoort, so it was Hennie's Vervoort, which has now created a whole new research project for astronomers finding this new object that nobody else had noticed before. So the crowd can be used, but I don't know very much about founding. Sorry that was such a long answer to a short question. <laughs> Peter. Um, I, I agree with as possible um, and um, to follow international best practice. But it is an issue. Lunch is calling, I think. <laughs> so as you 